Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Nama Budaya, Salam Kebajikan Good morning everyone Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya iwal musalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbi rasulillahi ajma'in Amma ba'du The Honorable Dr. Ani Susanti, MPDBI As the Head of English Education Department The Honorable Dr. Willy Arenandia, today's guest lecturer from Nanyang Technological University, University Singapore. The Honorable Lady Septiana Kurniati M. Hum, as the moderator of today's webinar. The Honorable all of the lecturer of English Education Department. The Honorable, the Honorable Bapak Dekan. The Honorable and the respectable all of the participants and committees. First of all, let's say thanks to our God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe, who has been giving us his blessings and mercy so that we can gather in this webinar. Second of all, may peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has guided us into the light of the path into the path of the light. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aisha Haril Surya. As a master of ceremony, I would like to say welcome to the international webinar series of English Education Department with the theme "The Power of Student-Centered Learning." Before starting our agenda, let me explain the agenda schedule of this webinar. First is opening, second is main agenda, third is key initiation, and the fourth is closing. The first agenda is opening. Let's open our event today by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillah. Bismillah. The next agenda is the main agenda, which we are waiting for explanation for our guest lecturer, Dr. Willy. Before that, let me introduce Miss Anna as our moderator for today's webinar. Miss Anna is one of the outstanding alumni of the Ahmad Dahlan University English Education. Miss Anna has received many awards in the academic file, debate community, and other achievement. Now, she is an Indonesian government lecturer in Yogyakarta Institute of Art, Indonesia. So, for Miss Anna, time is yours. Oke, okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning everyone. Good morning. Honorable Bapak Dekan, Honorable uh, Ibu Dr. Ani Susanti, and also all lectures, students, participants in this forum. Thank you very much for having me. I'm one of the uh, I'm Tri Satyana Kurniati, one of the alumni of English Education Department, Ahmad Dahlan University. It's very lucky to have you to have uh, this session to be a moderator. And then today's lecture will be presented by a very spectacular speaker, Dr. Willy A. Renandia. First of all, I would like to read some. CV of him. Uh, yeah. Dr. Willy Arenadia is a language teacher educator with extensive teaching experience in Asia. He currently teaches applied linguistics courses at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He has given also more than 100 keynote presentations at the international ELT conferences and has published extensively in the area of the second language education. And as our knowledge that his publications include language teaching methodology, an anthology of a current practice in 2002, under the sponsorship of Cambridge University Press and the Student Center Cooperative Learning, which was published in 2019 under the sponsorship of Springer International. Now, we don't need to waste the time. Please welcome Dr. Willy A. Renania with the topic of the power of student center learning. Time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, very nice introduction. Thank you, Ibu Ani, Pak Dekan, selamat pagi. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being for spending time with me this morning. Uh, I think 
Satyana. I think you forgot to mention that I studied in Yogyakarta many years ago. Uh, I did my bachelor's degree and also my doctorandus at the uh, Ikip Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta. But that was many, many years ago, 1975. And I finished in 1977 for my undergraduate. And then I went on to study for my doctorandus degree. Uh, nowadays, we don't have doctorandus degrees. We have uh, S2, S2, and S2 degrees. I remember visiting Ahmadran University some years back. Ibu Ani Santi, you probably remember. That was probably about 10 years ago. And I still remember uh, my presentation. And I enjoyed my time uh, in Yogyakarta back then. And also my presentation at your university. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bapak Ibu Skalian, the uh, topic of my presentation is something that most of you are very, very familiar with. It's about student-centered learning. If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you whether your teaching style is more towards the uh, teacher-centered style of teaching, or more towards student-centered style of teaching, probably your answer will be, Buani, your answer will probably be... Learning student-centered, but I don't know whether it's yes, student-centered exactly. or not. Just my game. Yes, that's, that's what I guess. Yes, many, many teachers that I've met with, when I ask them, when I ask them that same question, most of them, if not all of them, will say that I'm a student-centered, uh, you know, person. I pay attention. I try to address the needs of my students in the language classroom or in other language classrooms. So today I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts about student-centered learning and why student-centered learning is the kind of pedagogy that we should all be aspiring to do in the classroom, whether you teach language, whether you teach literature, whether you teach mathematics or science, whatever. I think the key words, uh, the key trend uh, today is for us to be able to sort of empower our students uh, in the learning process. Babay uh, Buskalian, I think in Indonesia, uh, everyone is talking about Campus Merdeka and all that, about uh, Merdeka Belajar, uh, and, and, and what I would like us to do is, as you listen to my presentation, think about how my presentation is related to the concept of Merdeka Belajar in Indonesia. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to ask you that question. What is the link? What is the, what is the relationship between my presentation on student-centered learning and the concept of Merdeka uh, Belajar, which is very popular now in Indonesia. But before I continue, let me just say very briefly about my university. Uh, the name of the university is Nanyang Technological University. It's located in Singapore. It is one of the two or three LPDP-approved universities in Singapore. So if you're planning to study overseas for your graduate studies, you might consider coming to uh, my university. It's, 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 it's a very good university. Uh, in fact, it's one of the uh, highly ranked universities in Asia, if not the world. Uh, I belong to the uh, School of Education, Fakultas Pendidikan. Uh, locally, it's called the National Institute of Education, uh, Fakultas Pendidikan. Uh, this is the best uh, Fakultas Pendidikan in Singapore. Uh, the reason being, this is the only one. So we have no competition, satu satunya faculty of education in Singapore. And that means if you, if, if people want to become an English language teacher or any other teachers in public schools in Singapore, they have to come and study with us for four years at least. And uh, I belong to the Department of English Language and Literature. Uh, we offer a wide range of courses, including Masters in Applied Linguistics and Masters in Education, and also PhD uh, in Applied Linguistics and also Doctor in Education in English Language 
education. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by showing you three pictures. Which of the three pictures best describe your teaching style? The same question that I asked you early on. This one. This one. Oh, this one. One more time. Oh, you can you can provide a response in the uh, your response in the chat box if you want to. This one. This one. Or this one. Or maybe if you want to, you can say none of the above, none of them. <laughs> but in a multiple choice situation, you have to choose one of them. Yeah, number one, number two, and number three. I think Wani mentioned that she is probably a number three, uh, you know, person. It's very interesting <clears throat> that in a student-centered style of teaching, uh, the teacher does spend time talking, explaining, teaching the students, but the amount of Teaching is kept to a minimum. The amount of lecturing is also kept to a minimum. And the amount of student learning increases a great deal because they are given a lot of time, a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things, to do a lot of thinking, to do a lot of doing in the language classroom. If you look at this picture, for example, most likely, there's only one person talking. There's only one person doing all the uh, explanation, doing all the uh, synthesis of information, doing everything for the uh, audience. The same thing with this one. Yeah, I think the teacher looks very animated. The teacher looks very enthusiastic. But chances are very high that yeah, it is the teacher who is the center of the classroom of whatever happens in the classroom. The students maybe are listening, you know, excitedly, but it is the teacher who does the teaching. And interestingly, it is the teacher who also learns a great deal in the process. Let me say this very carefully. Yeah, in a teacher-centered style of teaching, the teacher does a lot of talking, the teacher does a lot of teaching, the teacher does a lot of explanations and exploration of the topic. And because of that, the teacher also learns a great deal in the process. The students learn something, but not as much as what the teacher does. Yeah. So, Babu Skalian, today I'm going to look at three major points. The first one is... I'm going to invite us to explore a little bit about what it, what what SCL or student-centered learning actually is all about. Yeah, what does it mean when you say that you are a student-centered uh, teacher? And number two, I'm going to connect student-centered learning with motivation, learner or student motivation. I really, really believe that student motivation <clears throat> is at the center of student-centered learning. If the students are not excited, if the teacher is not able to keep the students motivated, I think it will be very difficult for you to, <clears throat> sorry, to organize a student-centered uh, learning in the classroom. And finally, I'm going to spend a bit more time looking at or exploring ways of motivating our students in the language classroom or in any other classroom, for that matter. Let me begin with the first one. The first one is, what is SCL? Student-centered learning. In brief, in a nutshell, student-centered learning is this. It's less about us, the teacher. It's more about the students. Yes, the teacher is there. The teacher organizes what happens in the classroom, but the uh, learning that happens in the classroom will have to be done in a big amount by the students. Yeah? One more time, it's not about the teacher, it's about the students. It's not about the teacher asking, am I a good teacher? Am I a wonderful teacher? Am I a fantastic teacher? That is not the issue. 
The issue is, am I the kind of teacher that can help my students learn optimally in the classroom? So that is what a student-centered uh, pedagogy or learning is all about. Just to give you an example of student-centered learning, I think you may have heard about many of these, you know, uh, methodology uh, that I have here on my screen. Problem-based learning is a great example of how a teacher designs their lesson around a problem. And then it is the students who spend a lot of time discussing, thinking about how they solve the problem. So the teacher's job here is to create a problem that will address some teaching points, that will address some learning points, but it is the students who spend a lot of time doing the exploration, doing the thinking, and spending time in order to solve a problem. In a language classroom, this is probably a language-related problem. For example, the use of past perfect tense, for example. The students can be invited to solve a problem yeah, by showing them maybe a number of texts where the past perfect tense is used and in some other texts where the past perfect tense is not used. Yeah, So we are providing students with a lot of opportunities to do a lot of learning by the teacher creating a problem for the students to solve, usually together in collaboration with other students in the classroom. Problem-based learning is also known as discovery learning. Yeah, discovery learning. What we do, Ibu Anisasanti, what we do can be called delivery learning. Delivery learning means we deliver to the students. We present information to the students. We do almost everything for the students. We explain as clearly as possible to our students. That is called delivery learning. Seperti pesan makanan. Everything is provided. Everything is there for you to enjoy. Yeah, We don't do anything. We just receive the food and we eat. That's known as uh, delivery. Yeah, But student-centered learning is about students discovering, finding, and learning a lot of things in the process. Now, the teaching happens when the students are really, really interested in finding, in, you know, in understanding things that they don't understand in the process of solving a problem or in the process of their discovery learning. And when that happens, the students ask questions, genuine questions because they are interested in, and this is where the teacher then explains to the students. Sangat berbeda dengan uh, delivery learning. In delivery learning, we prepare everything for the students, yeah? But in discovery learning or problem-based learning, the students really ask questions because they are interested, because they want to find the answers. And the kind of teaching is known as just-in-time teaching. And from the students' perspective, that is just-in-time learning. And that kind of learning is very strong, very powerful, and it results in lasting kind of a learning. Now, one important point to remember when you try to apply student-centered learning is this. As a teacher, I think we need to learn how to teach less. Yeah. Ibu Ani, in a one-hour lesson, what is the proportion, what is the percentage of you talking in the classroom? 80%, 90%, or 100%? <laughs> Yesterday I was teaching and yeah. probably 50%. Oh, that's good. Yes, 50% is good. Now, this is very important, Bapak Ibu Sekalian. Yeah. Uh, research after research tells us very clearly and convincingly that teacher talk time the amount of time teacher spends talking, teaching, explaining in the classroom can be as high as 
80% itu guru yang mengambil peran yang sangat aktif. Actively teaching, actively talking, explaining a lot of things to our students. Do students learn? Yes, they do. A little. Not much. Number two, the kind of learning that happens is likely to be fragile. Bahasa Indonesia-nya fragile itu apa ya, Bahan? Yeah. Fragile. Oh, mudah pecah mudah pecah, pecah artinya rapuh rapuh, <laughs> rapuh. <laughs> rapuh. Yeah. you learn something and then the next day you forget so the kind of learning is likely to be superficial yeah, cuman di awang-awang gitu very superficial, not deep learning and today we are looking at deep learning and student-centered learning is the way to go it has to be uh, <clears throat> done in a certain way so that we involve students in the uh, learning process. 50% is very good, Ibu Ani. Yeah. But maybe you can reduce it further to 40% so that the students do a lot more uh, thinking, a lot of learning uh, in the classroom. Bapak Ibu mungkin sudah pernah mendengar apa yang disebut sebagai genius hour. Ini adalah very progressive idea that has been implemented in some schools in the world. Not in Indonesia yet, but in some schools in the world. And not all schools. In it must be experimental. The idea is this. <coughs> curriculum itu 100%, begitu ya? Katakanlah curriculum itu 100%. Isinya adalah uh, scope, the content, and a lot of things that the teachers need to cover. 100% harus di... di you, you have to cover this, the syllabus. The idea of a genius hour is this. You set aside 20% or maybe 15% or maybe 25% for the students to explore a topic of their own interest. Nah, topik ini mungkin tidak ada hubungannya sama sekali dengan kurikulum. The idea is that if students are really, really passionate about the topic, If the students are really, really interested in exploring an idea, any kind of idea, they will learn a great deal. With, of course, with the help of the teacher and with the help of, you know, available resources that you have in your school or in your university. Now, the idea is very interesting. If you look at, you know, some of the most successful people in the world, Some of them actually drop out of universities in order to explore something that they are really, really, really interested in. So the idea behind Genius Hour, Genius Hour is really, really interesting because, because of the belief that every single person is a genius, is capable of learning of learning a lot of things if and only if we provide the opportunities for the students to explore a topic, anything that they are really, really passionate about. So student-centered learning basically is about that, about addressing students' needs to its maximum. Uh, let me continue. Now here is a little bit of a definition of a, of a student-centered learning. It's an approach that places more importance on what students feel, think, and do than what the teacher does. Yeah, the tiga dimensi ini. Feel, think, and do. Let's look at the uh, three elements one at a time. Feel, think, and do. Biasanya yang think and do yang lebih diperhatikan, yang feel itu kurang mendapat perhatian dari guru. But today I'm going to say to you that the first part, the feeling bit, the emotional aspect of learning is probably something that we should give a bit more emphasis. We need to keep asking yourself these questions. Are my students happy in my classroom? Do they enjoy the lesson? or things that are happening in the classroom. Do they feel safe? Merasa aman. Now, safe here means, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, not being laughed at. Kalau mereka bertanya, misalnya, and pertanyaannya mungkin sedikit, uh, not, very, not very intelligent question. Uh, are the students feeling safe when they ask questions? 
will they be the uh, target, the object of, you know, ridicule by the teacher and by the other students when they ask questions, when they suggest innovative ideas in the classroom. In other words, is the stress level low in your classroom? But most important, yang paling penting adalah yang nomor satu, curiosity. Yeah, keep asking these questions. Are my students curious in the classroom? If they are not, it's our job to design our lesson in a way that sparks their curiosity. Rasa ingin tahu, rasa penasaran. If you are able to do that, I think your students will learn a great deal more in your classroom because curiosity is the starting point of students engaging in a deeper level of learning so that they can say that I want to learn because I want to, not because I have to. So the curiosity uh, will have to be there. The other parts are important, and I think you will agree with me that in your lesson, the students will have to do a lot of thinking as well. Thinking to artinya apa? Banyak sekali. Connecting, constructing, exploring, uh, debating, applying, synthesizing, a lot of things to do with the uh, kind of thinking, mental processes that happen in the student's head. Yeah. Now, another thing that you might want to do is this, to get the students even more engaged in your lesson. You know, allow them to have a discussion, allow them to have a debate, allow them to spend time reading, writing, small notes, reading from the internet as well. And uh, with young children, you may also want to provide the opportunities for them to move about, yeah, or to use whatever uh, movement uh, they want to do in the classroom, maybe singing, maybe dancing, maybe, you know, using gestures to express their thoughts and ideas and things like that. So when you say student-centered learning, I think we are addressing minimal tiga. Yang pertama adalah the emotional dimension of learning. Are my students feeling okay in the classroom? And number two, the kind of thinking. And number three, the kind of behavior the kind of things that the students can do in the classroom. Uh, at this point, I would like to spend just one minute or two comparing and contrasting teacher-centered learning and student-centered learning. In a teacher-centered learning, I think I mentioned this early on, that the, the, the teachers spend a lot of time talking, explaining, exploring, providing examples and things like that. And because of that, the teachers are engaged in a deeper level of processing. I hope you agree with this. They feel excited. They feel invigorated. They feel that, you know, you know, they have spent a lot of time thinking and exploring a topic with their students. What about the students? Typically, they try to listen. They try to understand what they're explaining. Uh, but usually the amount of processing is likely, the type of processing is likely to be quite shallow, superficial kind of uh, processing because the teachers may not be able to engage the students fully in terms of their feeling, in terms of their thinking, and in terms of their doing as well. And because of that, the students feel bored, they feel tired, and uh, very soon they are you know, off task in the classroom. So if I were to ask you this question, who learns more in a teacher-centered classroom? Guania, are you still there? The uh, teacher or the student? Who learns more? Um, for the teacher-centered, the teacher learn more. That's right, yes. Maka Bapak Ibu jangan heran, uh, teachers become smarter and students do not become smarter if we adopt a teacher-centered uh, approach. Yeah? Mungkin sudah pernah mendengar ungkapan seperti ini. I think this is very good to remember to teach is to learn two times. So if you teach actually, if you do a good job teaching, I think that is an excellent opportunity for you to learn uh, a great deal uh, more. If you put your students in this position, where the students can teach each other, I think they will be able to learn a great deal more 
uh, as well. Yeah, so this is what happens in uh, the teacher-centered classroom. The teachers are doing all these wonderful things. Yeah, a lot of thinking happening in the classroom. And the students, are they doing the same thing? Not so much. I think they're busy listening and they're busy taking notes as well. Again, the amount of learning is likely to be small, it's likely to be thin, it's likely to be superficial, and also likely to be fragile. Student-centered learning is something which I said early on, is something that we should try to think about very carefully and see if you can adopt, if you can implement in your teaching. Because it provides students with deeper learning opportunities. It can get the students to be more actively engaged in your lesson before, during, and after the lesson is over. Let me say that again, because this is very important before, during, and after the lesson is over. Let me, let me quote. Let me share a quote with you. This is a very, very student-centered kind of uh, philosophy. Yeah, let's read this very carefully. Education, you can change education with learning. doesn't matter. Yeah, education, learning should be perceived as a continuing reconstruction of experience. In other words, before the students come to your class, they have to experience something. During your lesson, they have to experience something. And after the lesson, they should continue to experience or re-experience or reconstruct the experience. Bapak-Ibu pasti sudah mendengar yang namanya reflective teaching or reflective learning. And this is what it is all about. Yeah, If you teach in your classroom, when the lesson is over and the students are not given any opportunity to look back, to think back, to reflect on what they have learned, I think their learning is likely to be very minimal. It's likely to be superficial. Do you know who said this? I think Ibu Ani probably remember. Who said this? That education should be perceived as a continuing reconstruction of experience. Any Anyone? No? That's the guy. If you haven't heard about this person, this man, please Google him. I think you will find that what he said like 100 years ago uh, is still relevant today. He is, he is the guy who says that experience is important. Any kind of experience, including learning experience in the classroom, is important. But what is more important than that experience is what you do with that experience, how you make sense of that experience, how you can learn and expand your learning further as a result of experiencing uh, that encounter, that learning encounter in the classroom. Okay, that's the first bit, yeah. Uh, Student-centered learning, again, is not about us doing a great job as a teacher, using the best method in order to impress the students or to impress your colleagues. It's not about that. It's about the students. It's about how we can address the diverse needs of the students, how we can address the three most important dimensions of learning. The first one is the emotional aspect of learning, the uh, thinking, the uh, cognitive aspect of learning, and the behavioral aspect of learning. If you want to add another one, you can also add the uh, social dimension of learning whether and to what extent you provide students with opportunities to learn from their peers as well. So learning in groups, collaborative learning becomes also become very important. So emotional, cognitive, and then behavioral, and also social aspect of learning. I'm now going to try to connect our earlier discussion, SCL, with motivation. Motivation is the emotional uh, element of learning, yeah? Okay, the question is this, why motivation? I think the answer is very straightforward. I don't have to explain. I don't have to give you 
theories of motivation, every one of you knows that motivation is important. Motivation is about the will, the determination, the interest, and the thrill. Now, the thrill is very important. The thrill is the, uh, the excitement, the feeling that, hey, I'm re I really want to know about this. I'm really curious, the thrill of learning. And I want to spend more time studying or looking at that particular topic that has been introduced in the lesson early on, the will and the thrill of learning. The reason why it is important, I think we know that without the will, without the thrill, very little learning is likely to happen in the classroom. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is that student-centered learning works best when students are motivated. You'll be surprised at what students are capable of doing when they are truly, truly interested, when they are truly, truly uh, excited about learning. Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I examined a PhD dissertation by somebody from Indonesia. I think the, uh, the student studied at Auckland University in New Zealand. And her thesis was about interest in learning, interest in language learning. And I really liked the uh, thesis because it explored a very, very important topic in education, one that is particularly related to student-centered learning. Yeah, how we can engage students optimally in the classroom. Big question for everyone. You can give your answers or response in the chat box very quickly. How many of you students are motivated? Please be honest with yourself. If you teach English in particular, how many of your students are motivated? 25%, 50, no, 75, no. 100, yes. or lower than 25%. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. What is the answer? Mostly there should 75. be one more option, less than 25. Less than 25. And that is very true, Ibuani. I've been asking the same questions to many, many teachers uh, in Indonesia and in other places in Asia. And the answer is usually the same. Most of my students are not interested. They're not motivated in learning English. And that to me is one of the most important reasons why our students don't learn as much as we want to. One of the key reasons, yeah. And at the same time, we know this, the most motivated students are often the most successful in our classroom, whether it's language classrooms, or any other classroom, yeah? So let's say that 25% of your students are motivated, and you can be sure that you can see a very clear relationship or correlation between those 25 of the most percent of the motivated students and their achievement and their academic success, success in, in, in your English department. So in other words, our job, if you truly believe in student-centered learning, is this. Our job is to increase the number of students who are feeling motivated in your classroom. Maybe if, if the number is 25%, you can increase it to 50%. If it is already 50%, then it's your job to increase it to maybe 60, 75% of the students or everyone, if that is possible. So again, a big job for those of you who are interested in applying student-centered learning is this, getting students from saying, teacher, I can't do it, I don't want to do it, to teachers, I can and I will do it. Yep. But how do you get there? Now, here is something that I, you know, that, that, that struck me when I saw this quote from a book by Zoltan Donye, and the book is Motivation in Second Language Learning or something. Uh, it was published in, 20, in, in the year 2000, Cambridge University Press. I think you can Google the book and you'll be able to download the book if I'm not mistaken. Somebody, somebody has made it available on the internet. I think you should read that book. And this is a piece of advice for all of you here. Yes. Yeah. 
the best way to motivate students is to improve the quality of our teaching. Very, very important. What often happens is this, Baba Ibu, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. In the teacher's lounge, when you are talking to each other with the other teachers, uh, you will say things like, my students are not motivated and it's because it's because they are not motivated, because they're not interested. It's not our fault that they're not interested, that they're not motivated. Yeah. But if you ask students, they will tell you that, well, we are not motivated because the teachers are not motivating. So very careful when you try to, you know, to find the reasons why the students are not motivated. Chances are it's you, it's the teacher. And because of this, uh, a motivational scholar like Zoltan Donye, after thinking about the issue for many years, came to this conclusion. If you want this, your students to be motivated, the number one thing you should do is to is for you to be more motivating, to improve the quality of your teaching. And today I'm going to share with you six ways, six ways of motivating our students. And these six ways involve us making changes to the way we teach in the classroom. Let me say this again. Now, these six ideas involve the teacher making changes, important changes in the way we design our lesson, in the, in the way we design our tasks, in, in the way we choose the uh, reading passages, for example, the teaching materials in the classroom, and also in the way we assess our students in the classroom. Yeah, if you do that, chances are higher that the quality of your teaching will improve a great deal. And as a result, the students will become more interested, more motivated, more engaged in your language classroom. So how do we improve our teaching? Here, yeah. the Anam Te. T number one, T number two, T number three, T number four, T number five, and T number six. Jadi biar mudah diingat ya semua. All six ideas begin with the letter T. Here you go. Yeah. T number satu masih disembunyikan. T number dua adalah our teaching methodology, our teaching method. T number three is the teaching materials, the text that we're using in the classroom. T number four is the tasks, the activities that usually go with the teaching materials. T number five is the test or the assessment that we use. And T number six is how we use technology to motivate, to engage our students. And that leaves us with T number satu, terminal satu. Soekarno Hatta, Terminal 1. Eh, terminalnya udah buka belum ya? Di Jogja ya? Sudah ya? Sudah. Sudah ya? Sudah. Adisi Sudah. Jogta and Gia already yes. open. Hmm. I've been waiting for... I report now. Yes, I understand. I'm just waiting for a direct flight uh, from uh, Singapore, Singapore to Yogyakarta. Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe next month. And I'll visit you. Ahmad Alam okay. University. Okay, T1, Terminal 1. What is T number one? Come on. Please guess what is T number one? T number one is you, the teacher. Yes, the teacher. Now, I put the teacher at the center because research also tells us very clearly that T number one is underutilized. T number one adalah sumber motivasi yang luar biasa, but at the same time, T number one has not been fully utilized by teachers. And let me explain. Yeah. Okay, the teacher. Now think about you. <clears throat> think about your personality. Think about your characteristics of you as a teacher. Are you a motivating teacher? Now, this is an important question, and people have been asking this question for many, many years. And these are some of the attributes that are usually associated with a teacher who is 
motivating, who is a source of inspiration for the students. Relatable, are you able to connect with your students? Do you have good relationship with your students? Do you remember every the name of every single student in the classroom? And not just that, do you know the interest of your students? Do you know their family backgrounds of your students? Do you know some of the problems that your students encounter in their daily life, in their social life, and things like that? Yeah. Number two, very important. And I can ask you this question as well. Uh, Ibu Fatma, are you a likable teacher? Ibu Saptiana, are you a likable teacher? Ibu Ani Susanti, are you a likable teacher? Not sure. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> okay. If you're not sure, that's good. Because that means that you need to find out from your students whether and to what extent you're a likable teacher. What's the big deal about likability? Mungkin Bapak Ibu bertanya ya, likability apa hubungannya sih dengan seorang guru? It has a lot to do with how you relate with your students. When you teach in the classroom, <coughs> teaching is about relationship, yeah? And relationship is usually built around, you know, familiar ideas like, do I like my teacher? Do I like you to be my good friend, for example? Yeah, look at your friends. You have your, your best friends are those friends whom you like very much, right? And you get married with somebody that you like very much. So likability becomes very, very important. What if you're not likable? It's mm -hmm. difficult to find somebody who is not likable. What happens is that you don't know how to become more likable in the classroom. And one thing you can do, actually, is very simple. Yeah. If you demonstrate to your students that you like being in the classroom, being with your students, you know, uh, during the learning process, I think the students will likely feel the same way. Hey, look, my teachers always feel very excited when they're in my classroom. And because of that, the students will also feel excited. And that is how you build a very good, healthy uh, relationship with your students. So, Likeability is a very important criterion uh, for a teacher who is motivating in the classroom. Are you approachable? Can students seek help from you? Do students feel, uh, you know, inhibited when they try to seek help from you, either in the classroom or after uh, the classroom or after the lesson is over? Yeah, approachability. I think that is another source of motivation. Are you a passionate teacher? Or do you just do your teaching because that's part of your job as a teacher? You are paid to do a job, and that job is called teaching. I think the students can tell whether you are somebody who is really, really passionate about the lesson, about the subject matter that you are teaching. So passion is uh, important, and the students can see that. Are you an authentic teacher? Authentic teacher here means, are you a teacher who walks the talk? Ibu Ani Susanti, uh, are you an authentic teacher? Do you walk the talk? If you tell your students that, hey, reading is good, for example, yeah? Hey, kids, hey, students, reading is good. You have to read every day. That is telling. Telling the students that reading is good is not enough. I think you need to show the students. You need, to, you need to demonstrate to them, hey, look, I am a reader. I read every day. When I travel on the bus, I read. When I drive my car, I read. Please don't. <laughs> That's dangerous. Show the students that you do what you preach. So that's walking the talk, yeah? Being an authentic teacher. Again, this is a source of student motivation. They look up to you. They want to see that you are doing something that you are asking the students to do. The next bit is obvious. Are you a knowledgeable teacher? Yeah. Do you have sufficient information, knowledge about the subject matter that you are teaching? And the last one is, are you a lifelong learner? Are you somebody who is not uh, outdated? Bahasa Jawanya, jadul, ya? 
I think uh-huh. yeah, we have to be honest that there are teachers who are not up to date because they stop learning, because they don't continue learning. And today, learning is lifelong. So what do do? Even after you finish, uh, you know, your your employment, after you retire, you still have to continue learning for your own well-being, for your own mental well-being. So lifelong learning today is 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 important, and you want to demonstrate to your students that lifelong that you are a lifelong learner, and you also want your students to be lifelong learners as well. So the question here is: Are you a motivating teacher? Remember, telling your students that hey, students, you need to be motivated. That's not the way to go. Yeah, you need to demonstrate. You need to model to the students. You need to demonstrate. You need to show your students that you are passionate. You are eager, you're enthusiastic, that you walk the talk, and uh, you're approachable, you're likable, and all that. Even the way you talk, even the way you speak, even the way you walk, even the way you dress, your hairstyle, your glasses can be a source of motivation. So that's a teacher, yeah? So one big question for you to ask is, is there anything I can do as a teacher? to be a source of inspiration for my students. Now, here are some examples of a survey results that I did some years back. The survey asked about two or 300 teachers, if I remember correctly, about what is a good language teacher. If you look at the uh, results there, number one, very clearly, a good teacher is somebody who is able to motivate their students. All of the teachers, or the majority of the teachers, put that as number one. And number two is autonomy. What is what does autonomy mean? Can somebody explain to me what autonomy means? Ibu Setiana, Ibu Tiana, Ibu Tri. What is autonomy? Autonomy itu mandiri, mandi sendiri. Autonomy. That to me is very interesting because motivation is related to autonomy, student autonomy, student mandiri, siswa yang mandiri. So tugas atau ciri-ciri seorang guru yang motivating adalah seorang guru yang bisa memotivasi siswa sedemikian rupa sehingga siswa tidak terus-menerus bergantung pada gurunya. That is, I think, very important. And that is the result of teachers who are motivating. Yeah. Next, another question. Another question from the same uh, survey that I did. Yeah, guru-guru ini ditanya, kira-kira Bapak Ibu ini butuh, membutuhkan bidang professional development uh, apa? Begitu. Jawabannya adalah, tuh, nomor satu. And many teachers don't know how to motivate their students except telling the students, nah, nah, seorang siswa itu harus punya motivasi. But that, as I said earlier on, that is not enough, yeah? So today, I think you will be able to learn a lot about how you can motivate your uh, students. Okay, done with number one. So T number one, terminal satu adalah guru, yeah? The teacher, him or herself, can be a source of Motivation can be a source of inspiration. T number two, terminal number dua adalah teaching method. Teaching methodology. If you look at the uh, infographic there, I think you can see that there are many different ways of teaching in the classroom. Yeah, banyak sekali cara yang bisa kita pakai untuk mengajar how to engage your students in the classroom. Now, interestingly. The most popular, yang paling sering dipakai, yang paling popular adalah lecture, metode kuliah, metode cerama. That's the most popular. I think today what I'm suggesting is I think we should try, uh, you know, different ways of teaching in the classroom. We should try the kind of teaching methodology that is less teacher fronted and more students oriented or more students fronted, more students centered, if you like. Seperti inquiry-based, flip classroom also is very interesting. Uh, 
collaborative learning is also less teacher fronted because students are given a task to explore, to discuss, to debate with guidance from the teachers. So the key thing to remember is variety. Occasionally, kadang-kadang boleh memakai metode drama, but most of the time you should not be doing it. It's very efficient, but it's not the best uh, pedagogical approach that you should be using in the classroom. Jadi pertanyaannya mungkin adalah, is metode drama itu boleh atau tidak? Jawabannya boleh, but. Akan tetapi, kita mesti ingat, ini ungkapan yang sudah kita hafal gitu loh di luar kepala. Tell me and I forget. Metode ceramah itu ya seperti itu. You tell your students, and before the lesson is over, they have already forgotten what they learned from you. Show me, and I may remember. Beri contoh, ilustrasi. Involve me, and I'll understand. Involve me here means you have to involve your students emotionally, cognitively, behaviorally, and also socially. That is involvement. If you do that, students will... I hope they will learn a lot more from the classroom. So the key message I want to get across here is this. Lecture style, yes, kadang-kadang. Not too much. And even if you do the uh, lecturing style, I think you should avoid using monologic lecturing style. Satu arah begitu ya. I think you need to break up your lessons, your lecture style, mungkin 10 menit, terus dibantu dengan tanya jawab, dengan diskusi kelompok dan sebagainya. Uh, use dialogic style and also bite-sized learning. Diulang ya, bite-sized learning itu diterjemahkan menjadi setiap 5 menit atau 10 menit beri kesempatan pada siswa untuk to reflect, to to try to uh, recall the information, to try to extend what they have understood from your lesson uh, in the context of discussing, debating with their peers, for example. Jadi itu yang yang dua, yang kedua, <coughs> yang pertama adalah uh, the first T is the teacher, the second T is the way we teach in the classroom, and then T nomor tiga adalah the teaching materials, materi, materi ajar kita ini. Yes, I understand that our materi ajar seringkali sudah ditentukan oleh sekolah. Harus pakai ini, begitu. But that doesn't mean that you have no you know, flexibility. You have no ways of making the uh, teaching materials more interesting or more attractive. Pesan utamanya adalah ini. In the absence of interesting teaching materials, very little is possible. Jadi siswa begitu lihat materi ajar yang kita pakai, begitu lihat langsung ngantuk, begitu. Not much is possible. So the first thing for you to do is to find out, you know, to, to find a teaching, a set of teaching materials, maybe, maybe a written passage, a reading passage, maybe video materials, maybe other, you know, uh, multimodal text from the internet, uh, but make sure that the topic is of interest to your students. So a few things to remember, the text will have to be not just interesting, but compelling. Compelling itu artinya, it is so interesting that you want to work with it, you want to do it, you want to read it very carefully, you want to go deep into the text. Yeah, for that to happen, the text will have to be comprehensible. Ini terutama dalam uh, konteks belajar bahasa Inggris. Yeah? The text may be interesting, but if the language is not comprehensible, the students will not be excited, will not be motivated to explore the text. In other words, the content and the text will have to be just nice yeah, at the student's level. Uh, mungkin satu hal yang ingin saya tekankan adalah teks adalah sumber utama siswa memperoleh atau, atau belajar bahasa. The more texts you use that are interesting, the more texts you use that are comprehensible, I think the more students will learn and also enjoy your lessons. Uh, 
uh, in the classroom. Yeah. So there's a lot of learning when students find interesting texts. Maka dari itu uh, saat ini banyak sekali sekolah-sekolah uh, yang mengadopsi extensive reading uh, opportunities for the students to be engaged, to be exploring content uh, written in language that is interesting, that is uh, rich, that is authentic as well. Uh, these are some examples of materials that you can use in the classroom. I like TED. The content is very good, but the language usually is not too academic. Yeah. And you can find almost anything related to your teaching. Now, this one is about acid rain. This one is about engineering or architecture. This one is about business. This one is about Motivation, basically, psychological aspect of motivation. Uh, this one is also about motivation. So there's a lot of materials there on the internet that you can make use of. The problem, of course, is that the language may be a little bit too difficult for your students. And when that happens, I think you need to spend time helping your students to, uh, you know, to 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 read the text with comprehension. And one thing you can do is to use the uh, Google Translate, for example. Or you can you can modify the text so that the text becomes easier for your students to, to read and comprehend. Okay. So, diulang ya, nomor satu tadi adalah the, the teacher is a source of motivation. The teaching methodology is also a source of motivation. And the text, the teaching materials is also a source of motivation or demotivation uh, of your students. The next one is the task or the activities that go with the uh, teaching materials. The task will also need to be exciting, engaging, motivating for your students. Yeah, if that happens, students will become more curious and the students will engage in self-determined or self-directed learning. They will explore the task. They will spend time trying to solve the problem that you have created. And the students will engage with, uh, with, with a lot of all these wonderful ideas, or wonderful thinking processes, exploring, elaborating, assessing, uh, evaluating their own learning as well. Let me give you an example. Now, this is something that I often do in my teaching here at NIE. I don't teach language, but I teach how to teach language. In other words, I am a teacher, educator. Seorang dosen ikip lah begitu. Now, the course that I want to share with you, namanya adalah language teaching methodology, cara mengajar uh, bahasa, ya. Yeah? My students, very small, about 20, and they comprise local Singapore teachers and also international teachers from other countries in the world, from China, uh, from Vietnam, and from other places. The focus of my lesson, of my teaching, is on the theory and practice of language teaching. Jadi konteksnya seperti itu ya. Jadi ini mengajar konten sebetulnya, bukan mengajar bahasanya. But I hope you will be able to see that you know the way I design my lesson allows the students to do a lot of learning. Yeah, my my own teaching is very small. My own lecture is very small, but I get the students to think, to uh, discuss, to debate uh, during the uh, learning process. Uh, my lesson design it is seperti ini. Before, during, and after. Before itu artinya before I meet them in the classroom. So one week before. During means when I am with them in the classroom. After means when my lesson is finished. The students still need to do something. Yeah, konsepnya ini sama dengan uh, quote yang saya share earlier on. That education, learning is a continuous, is a continuing 
process of reconstructing uh, experience. Jadi belajarnya tidak hanya di kelas, tapi sebelum masuk kelas dan sesudah mereka di kelas. Kira-kira seperti ini. So before they come to my class, I sent them something using an application called Wakelet. A Wakelet is like a digital cabinet where I can, uh, you know, I can put information, uh, PDF file, YouTube video for the students to look at. And I also ask a small uh, set of questions for the students to think about before they come to my class. And then during the classroom, I provide a short lecture, stick it saja. And then the students are engaged in a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. After the lesson, another online task, but this time using Google Documents. Yeah, the learning outcome of this particular lesson is either uh, a small essay, two or three pages long, created by the students, and the students need to come up with a set of principles for teaching vocabulary. Okay, jadi kira-kira seperti ini. Before they come to class, they spend time, they explore the ideas about. What are the most important principles for teaching vocabulary in second language learning situations? So the students have spent time thinking about the topic. Bapak Ibu mungkin pernah mendengar yang namanya flip classroom. Itu salah satu bentuknya seperti ini. So before they come, they are already doing something. They are already learning something on their own. Okay. Now, during the classroom, during the face-to-face -face meeting in the classroom in my university, I lecture a little bit, and then students discuss and suggest two principles in Google Document. And because I have 20 students, what I end up with is about 20, 40 principles for teaching vocabulary. And I said to them, 20, 40 principles is too many. Itu terlalu banyak. Prinsip belajar itu mungkin hanya 5 atau 10 lah begitu ya. Kalau 20 is too difficult to remember. So what I did was I asked them to have a class discussion debating which principles must stay, which principles they want to throw away. There's a lot of learning happening here, discussing, debating, arguing, uh, providing theoretical justifications and things like that. And my job is mostly like a facilitator or mediator. Small amount of teaching, but a lot of student discussion in the process. <clears throat> when the lesson is over, I ask a number of students to continue working on the Google document and I ask them to provide an introduction and a set of principles that they discussed uh, during the classroom debate. And then one week or two weeks later, the students put together their thoughts, their ideas in an ebook format like this one. And the ebook is made available, is published in you know, Facebook and in also in my in my website for the whole world to see, basically. So just to recap, yeah, the design of the lesson is before, during, and after. The reason for this, I want my students to learn as much as possible. My job is mostly to provide or to design the lesson in such a way so, so that the students can explore the topic before they come to class. And during the classroom, they can further uh, enhance, extend, and deepen their learning in a group discussion context. And after the lesson is over, the students can also continue to reflect and also have a product that is useful, that is meaningful, and that can be shared with a lot of people, not just the students, but also other people uh, in the world. So that is the task, yeah? <coughs> The next T, I hope you, you still remember, yeah, the first T, Ibu Susanti, Ani Susanti, the first T is the teacher. Teacher. The second T. 
Tax? No, not Technic? yet. <laughs> methodology? Yes, methodology. Teaching, yes, teaching methodology. And then the next one is Tax. teaching materials, yes. The next one is task. Task, task yes. And the next one, next one is the test. test. Yeah, test. T yang lima, hampir habis nih sekarang. T yang lima is the test. Now today, I think people use a nicer term to refer to the test that we do. It's it, people use the word assessment today. In particular, teachers, educators put a lot more emphasis on what has been called assessment for learning, not just off learning, but for learning. The kind of assessment that we do, the you know, usually small, usually ongoing, usually formative in nature, namanya formative test gitu ya, small and frequent, and it's done in many different ways in order to address the different needs of the students. And the purpose of these assessment procedures is to support learning. Jadi tidak semata-mata untuk menghakimi atau memberi nilai akhir, but it's more about improving, you know, providing students with more support throughout the learning process. This is known as assessment for learning. And another important point is the idea that we should not be assessing students in one single way. Apalagi hanya dengan multiple choice tests. No, no, no. Not a very good idea. Uh, apakah hanya dengan bahasa? Verbal test? No, no, no. Today, I think we should broaden our perspective and allow students to express, to demonstrate their understanding in many, many different ways. Gambar yang di sebelah kanan itu adalah beberapa contoh where or how you can allow the students, how you can assess your students or how you can test your students using different uh, modalities, if you like. Sometimes verbal and sometimes kinesthetically dengan gerakan and sometimes visually dengan gambar, dengan apa itu namanya, comic strip, for example, and many other ways of You know, infographics, for example, that will be a, a nice way of checking whether the students have understood uh, what you have been teaching them. Ini sebuah contoh, and you can Google it, and you'll be surprised that there are many, many different ways of checking, of testing, of assessing, of you know, asking students to demonstrate your understanding or lack of understanding. Jumlahnya lebih dari 50. This is just one example of how you can expand, how you can broaden your tools, your assessment tools. Yeah. So that you don't always ask your students to do the same thing uh, during the assessment, uh, in the assessment process. Now, here is another one. Yeah. You can check your students using visual mode, using verbal written mode. Maybe orally as well, kinesthetically, using a discussion mode, using technology also to assess your students. So the key thing to remember is this. You should not be using tests as a way to prove that the students have learned. Bukan hanya itu. The test should be used to also improve learning, not just to prove that the students have learned, but to improve their learning. And you can do this If you are more flexible in your teaching, if you include a lot more assessment, informal assessment procedures uh, in, your, in your classroom. I'm almost done with the last one. The last T is technology. Whether we like it or not, I think, I think technology is going to be with us for many, many years to come. And we simply have to make use of technology to teach and to engage your students. Whether you're doing a face-to-face, -face, synchronous or asynchronous learning, technology is going to play an important role uh, in education. But the big question again for you is not to learn how to use as many tools as possible. I don't think that is the way to go. The most important thing for us is the question of whether technology can improve learning.
Now, here is a piece of advice that is very important for us to remember. To improve education, to improve learning, I think we should focus on pedagogy and not technology. Very important. Yes, we use technology, but what makes learning happen is not the technology itself, but it's the pedagogy behind it. So if you use technology with appropriate pedagogy, I think you will be able to help your students to learn more in the classroom. In other words, technology and pedagogy is a marriage made in heaven. Just one last slide, if I may. The key thing is we use technology in order to enhance learning. Bukan untuk pamer, bukan untuk gagah-gagahan. Hey, I use technology. I don't think that should be the way to go. Uh, think about how you can use easy to use tech tools. Yang mudah, yang gampang dipakai, yang tidak apa itu namanya, uh, internet or Wi-Fi heavy, if you like. Simple, easy, light, whether they are freely available. And the question of how many, tidak usah terlalu banyak, lima udah cukup. Now here is something that you can Google later. 10 teacher picks for best tech tools. Now these are tech tools that teachers from all over the world have been using and they found them useful. And you can Google it as well. Yeah. Apakah harus 10? Tidak. I think the key thing again is use a small number of technological tools that can help you help your students in the classroom. Now these are some tech tools that I've been using myself. They're very easy to use. Most of them are free, although you can pay if you want to use the full versions of the applications. But for most purposes, I think these applications can be use for free uh, in your teaching, yeah? Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of my presentation. So the first part again is a very important understanding of what student-centered learning means. I think that is the way to go. Yeah, if you, if you don't do student-centered learning today, I think five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you have to adopt a more student-centered learning. The reason being this, Bapak Ibu, ingat, uh, we have to remember that knowledge does not belong to us. We don't own knowledge anymore. Our schools is not the place, is not the only place for students to acquire knowledge. Knowledge is everywhere. Knowledge now is in the internet. And that is a big job for you. You can't possibly teach your students the knowledge that is available on the internet, you can't. But you can help the students to get more interested, more motivated, and more inspired to do independent learning by exploring the internet if and only if they are feeling curious, if and only if you provide students with opportunities to explore knowledge that is available. <clears throat> on the internet. The second part of my presentation, I'm looking at the relationship between SDL and motivation. And the last part is about six, six T's that we can do in order to help our students become more interested and more motivated in the language classroom. The teacher, the teaching methodology, the teaching materials, the tasks that we do, the, uh, the test, and finally, technology. Free gift from me. You can download all these books for free and many others from my website. You just need to remember my name and <clears throat> my name plus.com. That's it. Ibu Ani, Ibu Tristiapna, back okay. to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Willy uh, Renandia has already delivered the lecture. Now it's time for question and answer session. I welcome the participants to ask question or giving opinion. Time is yours. Yes, please. Direct question is good. Come, unmute the speaker, then you mm. can share. Come on. Okay. Uh, while waiting, Pak Willy, I'm, yes. I'm going 
to ask a question. I teach in one of uh, university that not focus or concern on English. Mm. Um, when I try to apply the ESP, English for specific purposes, especially English for art to my students in Institute Seni Indonesia Yogyakarta, yeah. I think I have difficulty to motivate them. Mm. Is that because I don't have background of art or uh, what actually my weakness is? Because I think uh, my students' motivation is still around mm. 60% in the class. Could you please... Uh, give you explanation about it. Sixty percent is not bad. I think sixty percent is very good. Uh, but by one one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my whole presentation is about student-centered learning, right? So the first thing for you to do is to ask your students. Get five students. Choose one who is really motivated and choose one who is only moderately motivated and choose one or two who are not motivated. I think you can tell, yeah? When you teach, you can tell which students are interested, motivated in your lesson and which students are not. So have a chat with them, have a conversation with them, have an honest conversation with them. I think there are different ways of, you know, getting honest responses from your students. But the first thing, for you to remember is are you open to suggestions are you open to an honest opinion from your students if your students say teacher i think your lesson is very boring are you are you ready to hear that if the answer is yes then that is the first thing that you need to, to do ask your students and be ready for them to tell you honest you know opinions about you so that's one thing that you can do. Another thing, uh, three, Ibu three, I think she is a teacher. I think I should call her Ibu three. Ibu three, uh, if you know a great teacher, an inspiring teacher, a teacher whom you respect a great deal, invite that teacher to sit in your class, to observe you, to observe how you teach your lesson. And then afterwards, ask her to give you an honest opinion about your teaching. And that is one, you know, that's another excellent way for you to improve on your teaching, to increase the level of motivation of your students. Or, or you can just have your lesson recorded, videotaped. And then at home, watch your video. Okay. And find, um, out, yes, and find out your strengths, your pluses, and your minuses. And then use that as a basis for improvement. Yeah, the key thing is, I'm glad that you asked that question because the most important thing for teachers to do is to be reflective, to ask yourself this big question. Am I a good teacher? Do I deliver a good lesson? Are my students motivated and interested? Yeah, if you believe that you can grow and become a better teacher, I think one day, maybe one year, two years, or five years down the road, you will actually become a better teacher. You need to be honest, though. You need to ask questions. You need to be willing to be criticized. Okay, thank you very much for the suggestion, Dr. Willie. Mm -hmm. I or you see. can ask me to come to Yogyakarta. You can buy me a return ticket and I'll come and visit you, observe your lesson for one whole week. Sure. <laughs> but you have to buy me the ticket. <laughs> the ticket. Okay. Uh, uh, from the audience, I can, I can see here some, some audience want to ask questions. We yes, start please. from Ahyarul Ihlias. Yes. No, Mas Ahyarul Ihlias. Yeah. Okay. Time is yours. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, yeah. my question to Doctor Willie is, why did you, why did you put technology? Do you use technology in the last position of the hierarchy? Because mm. I think that uh, some people may think that mm. use of technology could improve the, you know, could make the listen or the delivery of the listens mm. by the teachers more interesting. Which, of course, it is. Yeah. It will automatically 
uh, increase the motivation of the students. Yeah, mm. that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Why technology is number six? Okay. Uh, to me, technology is a tool, alat. Seperti slide itu alat ya. Seperti PowerPoint, projector, papan tulis. Everything there that you use for teaching is alat. It's a tool. A tool is a tool. But how you use the tool can make a big difference in the kind of learning that you want to happen in the classroom. So I will stick to my belief that technology does not improve learning. Yes, technology can make the students more interested, especially if it's a new piece of technology. Yes, but the students are motivated because the technology is new. But once the newness is gone, the motivation also disappears. Yeah, so I think, again, I will keep emphasizing that technology does not improve learning. It is the pedagogy behind it that improves the learning, that makes the difference in the language classroom. Selamat pagi, Ibu Eka Wahyuningsi dari Universitas Negeri Jember. Good morning, Pak Willis. Good morning. morning, Ibu. So that will be my response, Pak. Yes, I know that everyone is talking about technology these days. Technology has a lot of potential. No doubt, I agree with that, but it's how we use technology. It's the teacher. Is the teacher, is the teaching methodology that is important, that can lead to more student learning in the classroom, not via technology. Okay, thanks for the answer, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mas Ahyarul Ilyas. Now I'm going to invite Bapak Muhammad Sayuti. Time is yours. No, yes. Handung first. Handung raise hand first. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pak Handung. Okay, Pak Handung okay. first. Well, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Bu Anna, Pak Sayuti, and also Mr. Willy for the time. Well, I, I have two questions. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, well, so my first question would be actually almost similar to Bu Trisetiana. It's about, uh, what is that? Uh, the student's opinion about our teaching method. In the beginning, if I'm not mistaken, you told us this. It's actually not about how good we are for students. But in the middle of your presentation, you also told us that we we need to ask our students about uh, do they enjoy our class and mm. that are we yes. motivating enough for them and so on and so forth. Do you think how do we do that? Should we give them like Google form or any form in the end of the class mm. or in the semester? to yes. evaluate our teaching method or or mm. what? Yes. That's the first question, but we yes. And then the second one is that about the oh, the third piece, if I'm not mistaken, it's about task, mm. right? Because some of my classes is uh, are also English for specific purposes. Mm. Then sometimes it was quite difficult for them because we only had once in a week for the mm. meeting. Yeah. And when... The flip classroom exists, like for example, I give them first the text that they need to actually read before yes. the class, or I give them some tasks at home just to evaluate what they learn during the class. Sometimes mm. they were less motivated by by the task. Should uh, yeah. so? How do we do with that? How do we deal with that? Should we uh, what kind of assignment or test that we have to give them, mm -hmm. or we should provide also the reward and punishment about about the task? that they do. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, uh, the first question mm, is asking students the only way that we can get feedback uh, about our teaching. The answer is yes and no. Uh, if you ask students to fill a form, for example, chances are they will say nice things about you. So you won't probably be able to get the most you know, relevant, the most useful piece of information from your students. Uh, I think my earlier suggestion to Ibu Anna uh, is probably something that you might want to do. Ask somebody, not just anybody, yeah? ask somebody that you believe is a great teacher, is an excellent teacher, is a motivating teacher. Ask that teacher to come to your class and observe your teaching. But be ready to receive very strong, very honest feedback. Feedback can be very painful. Yeah. But it's because the feedback is painful that we can grow. If you don't want to hear any, you know, 
uh, bad feedback from other people, then don't do it because 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 you won't learn anything from a friend who will just tell you, "Wow, Pak Handung, you are the best teacher that I've never seen in my life." That won't. You have to tell them that. Oh, best teacher, I already know that I'm a best teacher. What I want to hear from you is how can I improve? Because I do want to improve. And I believe that people can and should improve. You should not stop growing. Life is about growing, yeah? Not just in salary, but also in our ability to engage our students uh, in the classroom. Uh, your second question is a bit tricky. Uh, Yes, I understand what it feels like, what it is like to be teaching. Itu mata kuliah umum atau mata kuliah? This is yeah, khusus. Yeah. And Sometimes like yeah, mata kuliah yes, umum. Mata kuliah khusus. Itu seminggu sekali ya, Pak, ya? Yes. Once a week, yeah, I think. That makes it really difficult. Uh, I remember having a conversation with a professor from Indonesia, Atmajaya University. This was like 20, 30 years ago. What he said actually uh, resonated with me. He said that teaching English in universities for, you know, for mata kuliah, apa namanya ya? Bahasa Inggris yang seminggu sekali itu mata kuliah apa ya? Umum ya? Mata kuliah? Ya, mata kuliah umum, I think, sir. Mata kuliah umum, ya. Mata kuliah umum, ya. Ya. It, uh, the, beliau mengatakan itu dihapus saja kok nggak ada. It's very difficult for you to really help your students to improve on a once a week kind of uh, English language lesson. If you want to improve the quality, the uh, level of proficiency of our students, I think we should do it at the high school level or at the SMP and SMR level because they have six years, yeah? Nam tahun. And that is something that you can do in order to improve their language proficiency, their interest, their motivation, and so on and so forth. If you meet your students once a week and the number of students is like 100, there's not much that you can do actually. So I don't think I can give you any tips or suggestions. Nobody can, it's not possible. But I would suggest if you can, if you are in a position to make changes, is for you to implement extensive reading in university level, at the university. And this is happening in many universities in Japan. A lot of universities in Japan now implement what is known, what is called extensive reading. Membaca. Membaca sebanyak-banyaknya. Itu adalah konsep uh, tujuan utama dari extensive reading. The reading will have to be interesting. So the materials will have to be interesting. The students get to choose the materials. Mereka yang pilih kok. Yeah. And the teacher's job actually is to, to provide the, uh, the kind of motivations that the students need to, you know, to, to, to monitor students' progress, to help the students find the right kind of materials for the students. Mengapa tidak English for specific purposes? That is another thing that I, in my opinion, I don't think we should be teaching English for specific purposes. I don't think we should be doing that. English for specific purposes are for those people who have already achieved sufficient proficiency in the English language. Levelnya kira-kira sudah B1, ya. B1, itu CFR B1. Kalau IELTS itu ya IELTS 5 lah, begitu. And then you can use a lot of EAP or ESP uh, materials, not before that. I think it would be very challenging, very difficult. I don't think you can be the most motivating teachers if you teach ESP for students whose level of proficiency is below five on IELTS or below B1. It's very, very difficult. It's very challenging. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Willy. Next, we are going to invite Bapak yes. Muhammad Sayuti, please. Yes, Pak Sayuti, please. Okay. Thank you, Pak Willy, for sharing experiences and knowledge to us. So my question is, I'm dealing with the situation or culture when I attract students to share their thoughts, their mm -hmm. feeling. 
Yeah. They keep silent, Pak Wini. <laughs> I don't know what's the problem. So yeah. sometimes I make compulsory. I will end my course after you asking some question. But mm. it's very hard. Very. Uh, I have to struggle with to build the the habit expressing their feeling, their thought, mm. their ideas. I don't know whether, yeah. whether this is typical Indonesia or it, it uh, might some be. Yeah. particular culture. Yes, they it keep might be. silent and then, yes, I don't know mm. whether they grew up in the same situation mm. when they were in primary school or secondary school. Also, the teacher is uh, uh, let them quiet. Yes, because mm. I read a recent report that teacher Indonesia is very, very low level of talking also yeah so give them assignment and then let yeah. they do the job and then no comment no feedback no everything so mm. how to deal with the very silent students mm. thank you the second yes. one is uh according to buani we need uh further cooperation with national institute of education nanyang so i hope you have time in the future to talk and then discuss uh discussing opportunities for future cooperation between UAD and uh, National Institute of Education Nanyang University thank you mm. yes the first question is very interesting Pastor Ayuti uh the students are quiet the students are not responding to questions uh as as you said it could be cultural it could be you know the kind of things that the students expect to happen in the classroom uh I think since primary school uh, they have been sort of conditioned that in the language classroom or in the classroom, uh, that it is the teacher's job to speak, to talk, and the students will just need to listen and uh, respond mentally, but not verbally. It could be cultural, yes. Uh, it could also be because of the way uh, we teach, the culture of teaching, the culture of education. Uh, I think if we can start, you know, implementing student-centered learning since the students are still in primary school, I think chances are higher that they will be more willing to contribute to dialogue with the teacher uh, in the classroom. I think that is the only way that we can do it. Uh, remember, children... Young children are curious by nature. Before they start school, before they start school, they ask questions all the time. They do. But once they start school, they stop asking questions. Alasanya, because of us, because of the way uh, we, you know, we present ourselves in the classroom, because of the way we teach. I think we are not... We are more authori authoritative or authoritarian. Which one, Buani? Authoritative or authoritarian? Maybe both. <laughs> the second one. Yeah, the second one. And because of mm -hmm. that, students don't feel safe. They don't feel, you know, they don't, they don't feel safe emotionally and also mentally to ask questions. But before they start school at home, they feel safe because the parents will always listen to their questions. Yeah. So I think it is a big job for us to change the way we connect, the way we relate uh, to our students. I think we can we can start when you know the kids are still in primary school. But at the university level, Sayuti, I think what we can do, now this is again. Uh, reported by a lot of friends and also based on experience, if we adopt a more student-centered learning, and usually a student-centered learning involves students working in groups, collaborating in groups, I think they are more willing to communicate. They are more willing to contribute ideas. They are more willing to express their thoughts and opinions in a group setting. Not always, but I think if we prepare them well, if we prepare, if, if, if we do a good job of preparing our students before they work in groups in a collaborative setting, I think they will be you know, more forthcoming in sharing their thoughts, in exploring ideas together. 
maybe not in English, maybe in Bahasa or maybe in Javanese or maybe in, you know, using a mixture of Bahasa English and Bahasa Indonesia. So I think I think it's possible. Yep. But relationship yeah. again is very important. Relationship. Teachers, if if your students look at you like somebody who is very distant, jaraknya terlalu jauh, I think that alone is 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 a is 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 a hindrance for the students to respond to your questions because they're always afraid of responding to your questions. Uh, teachers also tend to be rather judgmental. If you give an answer, then the response is usually, "Hey, that's a bad answer." <laughs> so I think we have to open up the space a little bit so that the students are more willing to explore creative and innovative ideas. Yes, Ibulara yeah. Siti Malida has been raising her hand since yesterday. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> Mbak Lara. Actually, my question, uh, maybe it's related with the previous one. Uh, mm. um, I want to ask about how to motivate students to speak in English mm. in university level, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the same idea. The same, yes. Yes, same with idea. Ayuti. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Bapak Ibu, mungkin satu point yang perlu diingat. Sometimes students don't want to speak, not because they don't want to speak, but because they have nothing to share. Idenya nggak ada, atau kalaupun idenya ada, they have ideas, but they don't have the language. Tidak memiliki, tidak punya cukup kemampuan berbahasa untuk menyampaikannya dalam bahasa Inggris. So two problems. You need to find out which one is which. Biasanya dua-duanya begitu. So my suggestion is for you to not, you know, in your speaking class, for example, do not just make your speaking class a class where the students have to speak all the time. To me, a good speaking class is one where the students have read and have listened to a lot of related topics. Jadi, misalnya topiknya, misalnya, katakanlah topiknya adalah mengenai uh, sekarang zamannya pandemi ya. Okay, the topic is about pandemic. It's not enough for you to say, hey class, today is pandemic. Yeah. Okay, what are some of the words that you need to know about the pandemic? And then ditulis kata-katanya. Now it's your time to discuss. They won't be able to discuss that. They don't have sufficient knowledge. They don't have enough language. What you should be doing is give students as much as apa namanya, video discussions on pandemic, reading passages or newspaper articles about the pandemic, they have to do this as much as possible before they can produce, they can speak, they can use English to present their ideas. So, so in other words, the students need to know a lot about the topic from reading. The students need to know a lot about the language, the vocabulary, and the grammar from listening and from reading before they can speak, if, before they are you know, able to uh, share their thoughts and ideas in the English language. Jadi kesalahan yang sering kita lakukan adalah kurang persiapan. Persiapan yang kita berikan pada siswa itu terlalu sedikit. Gitu. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Willy. Thank yes, you, please, Lara. Lara. Please give it a try, Lara. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Dr. Willy. Hmm. Other participants, do you still have questions or other opinion? Questions are in the chat yes. box. Ibu Surya. Uh, itu di chat box uh, would be two question there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that your question? No, sir. I'm mm. one yes. of the ways. Which one? I can't access because form is no longer accepting responses and has been set automatically. Uh, that? In no. the chat box. Okay, I think Pak Willy, I can help you to read the yes, question. Yes, please. Oh, probably we can invite the participants to us directly, mm, Mr. Johannes. That's, yeah, that's better. Uh, Johannes. Mas, Mas oh, Johannes. Ibu, uh, Adriani. 
Okay, I'll, I will I will read that. Yes, yes. Really, nah, itu ada Pak Yohanes tu. Ah, okay. Oh, hilang lagi. Ah, okay. Hello, Pak Willy. Hello, okay. Pak. Yeah, thank you for uh, responding my question here. I would mm. like about the assessment, Pak, for vocabulary class. Actually, I got a little bit a problem there. Mm. Uh, I cannot decide whether writing is the best way or speaking is the best mm. way to assess my a student vocabulary uh, improvement like that. Mm. Uh, mm. Could yes. you please give some suggestion about that? Thank you. Yes, good question. Uh, if you want to find out about your student's vocabulary knowledge, we first need to understand whether we want to find out the number of words that the students know or how well students know the words. Ini dua hal yang agak berbeda ya. They are related but they're different. Kalau hanya ingin tahu berapa banyak, berapa besar kosa katanya, I think we can use a test. And uh, there is a test that is available uh, that has been used for many, many years, developed by Paul Nation. I think it's a multiple choice test. It, it basically gives you information about how many words your students know. Itu mudah sekali diakses di Google ya. Mungkin, mungkin kosa kata siswa itu sekitar 2000, 3000, dan, dan seterusnya. But if you want to find out whether your students are able to use the words for speaking purposes or for writing purposes, then the best way for you will be to give them a speaking or writing test. Either one is fine. Because, because speaking provides opportunities for the students to use vocabulary and to choose the words carefully, depending on the purpose, depending on the audience, depending on the context. And that can only be measured through a performance-based test, like speaking, like writing. Now, speaking here can be uh, a monologic you know, speaking, or it can be a dialogic uh, you know, interview kind of a speaking uh, test. But either one is okay. Okay, thank you, Pak Johannes. Okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Johannes, Mas Johannes. Pak Dr. Willy, there is uh, one question from the chat box I'd like to read for you. Yes. Hello, Pak Willy. I would like to ask about the differentiated, in, the differentiated instruction. Yes. Do you think this learning method is feasible mm. to be implemented in the Indonesian EFL context? And yes. what are your suggestions to effectively mm. implement it in Indonesia? Yes. Now, yeah, DI, differential instruction, DI, is very much related to our discussion today about student-centered learning. DI itu adalah, uh, apa namanya, an approach to teaching that respects, that tries to address differences that we have in the classroom. In other words, it's very student-centered. We want to make sure that our lessons are relevant, are suitable, are motivating for as many students as possible. Yeah, the starting point is that the students are different. Some are better than the others in terms of their English language proficiency. Katakanlah, di kelas itu ada dua kelompok siswa, yang satu itu mungkin better in terms of their ability to speak English and the other half is not as good. So what, what can you do? One thing you can do is to find different set of materials that will address the needs of these different groups of students. Now the next question of course is, is it easy to do? The answer no, it's not easy to do. Anything that involves us addressing the different needs of the students is not going to be easy for, the, for us to do because we are used to doing things in the same way. Before I walk into the classroom, I need one set of teaching materials. I need one set of tasks and activities. I need one set of assessment procedure. Satu, satu, satu. You are addressing no one actually or you try to address everyone's needs in the classroom, but at the same time, you are also addressing nobody's needs in the classroom. 
So differentiated instruction is about us being more sensitive to differences uh, in the classroom. Is it something that is doable? I think so. The first starting point will be for you to provide choices in the classroom. Again, before I move on, I must tell you that DI is messy. Yeah, messy means it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in your lesson. In the, in the traditional teacher-centered classroom, you are in control, yeah? You decide almost everything. You know what is, what is step number one, you know what is step number two, what is step number three, you know how to end your lesson. In a DI, things are not very easy to predict. It's a bit messy. But the question is, which one is better, predictable or messy? If you believe in student-centered learning, then things that are messy in the classroom is not a bad idea. Actually, it's a very good idea because you're addressing different needs of your students. Now, DI is about tiga hal. Ada tiga dimensi DI. Satu yang pertama adalah content. Bahan ajarnya harus berbeda. Katakanlah, biasanya memakai satu bahan ajar. Sekarang kita mungkin milih tiga macam. Tiga macam bahan ajar. Dan siswa boleh memilih yang mana yang mau di yang, ma, yang mana yang mau dikerjakan begitu. Terus yang kedua adalah pedagogi. The way we teach will have to be uh, addressing the uh, different needs of the students. So you need to use a variety of teaching methods, not just lecture, but also discussion, debate, maybe flip and and things like that. Yang ketiga adalah assessment. The assessment also will have to be different. Is it easy to do? No, it's not easy to do. Is it important for us to learn how to do it? I think so, because that's the future. The future is how we can increase the amount of learning in the classroom. And one way for us, or the only way for us to do that is to use to make use of student-centered learning. And student-centered learning means that our teaching is driven by the needs of the students, the differences that happen in the classroom. Are we okay, there yet? We... I don't think we are there yet. <laughs> yes, Sylvia thank, is asking. Yeah, thank you very much, Pak Willy. Yeah. That's okay, really Mbak Andriani, thank you also. And the next one is Mbak Sylvia Nanda, Dr. Willy. Yes, Mbak Sylvia. Good morning, Mr. Willy. Yes. Good morning. All right, so thank you, uh, Bu, for the times. And uh, my question is, is actually the same with the previous one. Uh, Mr. Willy, I teach English in general. Mm. And mata kuliahnya, Bahasa Inggris 1, Bahasa Inggris 2, and Bahasa Inggris Dasar. Actually, I teach in the, um, account accounting program. Mm. And, and I teach in online ways. Mr. Okay. Willy, so I applied some like digital technology, like mm. uh, quizzes, word wall, yeah. and etc. Yeah, and I think that it 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 can help me. But mm. but but uh, sometimes I feel that this method will make them boring like that. Mm. So what actually the best and effective ways to teach? using student center learning mm. in online ways. Yes. Yes. So uh, yes. Can you tell me what what is the coverage of your Bahasa Inggris 1? Actually, Kontennya uh, apa? Kontennya, what is the content of Bahasa, Indonesia, Bahasa Inggris 1? Actually, um, the content is like in yeah, tenses. Oh. tenses and then, grammar, yeah? Uh, uh, grammar, like that. Grammar, yeah. Short, okay. short. Mm. Sorry, invitations okay. like that. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, mungkin satu hal yang ingin saya sampaikan pada Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, grammar. Uh, grammar is important. Yes. But does it mean, when I say grammar is important, that does it mean that we have to teach grammar all the time? I said all the time because Bahasa Inggris 1 is at the university level. Betul ya, Bu? Silvi? Yeah. Oh. Bahasa Inggris satu di kelas apa itu? Di kelas akuntansi. SMP, SMA atau university? Akuntansi. 
university. Oh, university, yes, yes, yes. Uh, as I said, but uh, grammar is important, but it doesn't mean that we have to teach grammar all the time. If I can give you a suggestion, I think we should not teach grammar too explicitly. We should not be teaching the past tense, for example. We should not be teaching the present tense. You can mention it very briefly, but what is important is for the students to know how to use the past tense and the present tense. And the best way actually is not to teach them. Anna here. The best way is not to teach them. If you teach them, the students can tell you, oh, past tense itu dipakai untuk ini nih. Satu, dua, tiga. Itu pengetahuan namanya. Itu pengetahuan bahasa. Bukan kemampuan memakai bahasa. Bukan kemampuan memakai tata bahasa untuk berkomunikasi. Jadi banyak terjadi kesalahan yang sudah terlanjur dilakukan selama beratusan tahun sebetulnya. That we teach too much grammar. The students do not need more grammar at the university level. Tidak. Now, the best way to learn grammar, bukan to study grammar, to study grammar itu harus dianalisa, ditulis, diapalin, diingat-ingat aturan-aturannya itu seperti yang kita ajarkan di kelas sekarang itu. That is, that is how the students learn the knowledge of English grammar. I think what we need to do is to provide students with the opportunities to, to learn, not to study, but to learn the grammar. And the best way is to learn the grammar in context. Now, konteks yang paling baik untuk belajar bahasa Inggris adalah dengan membaca dan mendengarkan. Hanya itu kok. Membaca dan mendengarkan. Atau sekarang itu nonton. Viewing. So, reading, listening, and viewing. They have to do a lot of this. Kalau sudah membaca begitu banyak, mendengarkan begitu banyak, dan nonton video begitu banyak, dan siswanya tetap tidak bisa belajar bahasa Inggris, tidak bisa memakai bahasa Inggris, something is wrong with the bahan, bahan baca, baca, bahan baca, dan bahan you know, the listening materials. Hanya ada dua, two things that you need to remember. Number one, the reading materials or the story, a novel, will have to be very interesting. Kontennya harus interesting. Remember, if the text is not interesting, nothing much is possible. Yang kedua, bahasanya harus bisa dipahami. So, comprehend, so compelling and comprehensible. You know, give them one year and you'll be surprised as, at how much you know, improvement uh, they will have made. Their grammar will be much improved. Bukan, bukan aturan-aturan tata bahasanya, tapi kemampuan mereka memakai tata bahasa, memakai vocabulary, is going to increase a great deal. So I would not recommend that you use yeah, that you teach more grammar. Not very useful. Seriously, grammar should not be taught in that way. Grammar should be discovered. Masih ingat ya discovery learning yang saya, saya sampaikan tadi itu discovered. Grammar will have to be discovered. Grammar cannot be acquired explicitly by us giving detailed explanation. Akibatnya adalah kalau siswa tidak bisa memakai bahasa Inggris, tidak bisa berkomunikasi, speaking in English, very often we say, teach them more grammar. No, that's wrong. They don't need more grammar from us. Uh, agak panjang ya, Ibu Sylvia. Yeah. Okay, ya, Ibu Sylvia. Baik, terima kasih banyak, Pak Bibi. Thank you so much, Mr. Riley. Really. Yes. I will be speaking in Bali in December. I think if you can, if you have the time, please come and join me in Bali. It's, it's, it's a big conference organized by the British Council Indonesia. Tanggal 9 dan tanggal 10. Insya Allah, Pak okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> Dr. Willy, thank you very yeah. much. And others, participants? Kayaknya Bu Ani belum tanya tuh. <laughs> <laughs> Bani, I, think is, I think she is yeah. happy with everything. No, no, no. I'm just uh, reflecting what I did so far. I'm afraid that yeah. I did mm, well. I'm not sure what I did is student centered, mm. but 
I think sometimes I was upset when the students just keep silence. Moreover, mm. in this online in these online situations, mm. when you just ask in the WhatsApp group, no one answered. Then mm. we we when we explain in the Gmail or in the Zoom, no one comment. Seems mm. everyone knows everything. But then when we ask, when we assign the students to do the task to work, um, then it's beyond expectations. I just mm. feel like, mm, I think we really need to work, um, prepare everything with plan A, plan B, plan C and everything for oh, I like that. For, yes. yeah, more, more preparations, I mm. guess, yes. for, for, for optimizing the learning. Mm. Yes. Uh, I think preparation is key. The yeah. teacher being more prepared is key. I, li I like what you said about having plan A, plan B, plan C, and so on. But the students will also have to be prepared. Before they have their online lesson, they have to come prepared. Prepared here, artinya, the students have heard about this. The students have read about something, about the topic that you will be discussing. And that is now that has now become a standard practice for me. Dari setiap minggu sebelum saya bertemu dengan mahasiswa, I will send them something for them to think about, either through WhatsApp or through you know my favorite application called Wakelet. And then, not only that, I included participation as part of the uh, overall assessment of the students. So I think in some classes it's worth more than 15%. Partisipasi nilainya 15%, begitu. I think I have one yeah. question for you, Pak yeah. Sometimes we have several classes for, um, for example, in speaking class, we have five parallel classes mm. with different students, different lecturers. Yeah. Um, do we need to, to teach in the same way or do we need to measure in the same way or mm. achieve the same goals? Mm. Is it the way we teach or the way we assess which mm. need to be okay. parallel? Yeah. yeah, I think the way we teach can be different, but the goal will have to remain the same. Tujuannya harus sama, karena tujuan itu menentukan kan uh, at the end of the uh, you know of the uh, semester students will be able to do A, B, C, and the assessment will have to be the same. Okay, I mean so... the the the, uh, the criteria for assessing students. We'll have a bit the same, but the way we teach, the way we assess, can be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so the most important thing for parallel classes mm -hmm. is the way we assess, or at yes. least the blueprint for this. Assessment. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. and okay. I, I, I think you need to appoint a coordinator as well. Mm -hmm. The coordinator's okay. job is to make sure that quality is maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the different uh, lecturers teaching on on the same course, mm -hmm. coordinator. And the coordinator will have an important job of sitting, observing, and providing feedback. Mm -hmm. I think okay. that is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so yeah. much, Pat Willy. I, I plan to invite you, uh, well, in, in case, but I don't know mm -hmm. whether we are ready to receive the feedback, honest feedback from you. That's mm -hmm. what we need to prepare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'll be very happy to come in, you know. Okay. Look at your syllabus or look at your curriculum. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've, I think I've done that for UM Malang. I've done that for UNY and mm -hmm. Sanada Dharma as well. I think, mm -hmm. I think it's always a good idea to have somebody from outside. Mm -hmm. To see. Yes, yes, because More somebody from outside will tell you exactly mm -hmm. what you, you know, what you don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we need to be ready to hear. Yes. Okay, thank you so I'm, much, Pavili. Yes, I'm very gentle, Bu Ani. <laughs> we are not us. <laughs> yes. So gentle feedback from me. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Iwani Susanti, and also Dr. Willy. Mm. I think it's uh, 11, more than 11 p.m. EM, yes. sorry, yes. EM, sorry. Yep. Uh, announcement from the committee that Bapak Muhammad Sayuti, Mas Ayarul Irlias, Mas Patria Handung, Mas Yohanes, Mbak Delara Siti, Mbak Andriani Yulia, Mbak Sylvia Nanda, and Iwan Isanti will get their prize because they respond our uh, session this morning. 
Oh, that's yes. nice. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and what then kind of um, price? finally, I would like to uh, read some notes. Or maybe pa, Dr. Willy would like to add uh, uh, important information at the final session. No. You want to add? No? Nope, okay. Nope. I've, okay. I've so said everything that I wanted to say. You have already yeah. said. Okay, then um, uh, please give me permission then to uh, make a summary from this session. Mm. Uh, the title of the Power of Students Learn uh, Center Learning is very interesting for everyone, especially academician. So this is to differentiate between teaching method in the past time and in the current trend of te teaching methodology is by applying uh, this method, method that is student-centered learning. And number two, teacher-centered learning spend too much time doing explanation, elaboration, exploration, and others. So the way to save energy of teaching is applying the power of the student-centered learning. Number three, it is more effective for teachers to get the learning target by applying the student-centered learning because students will be more active in that case. And number four, motivation is one from some important things in SCL or student-centered uh, learning that can be recognized by teachers, task, tasks, text, as well as the technology that works together to run the well-organized student-centered learning. And the last one, when we are successful creating the good atmosphere of the class by running student-centered learning, it will also create a good atmosphere of the university. That's some notes from me. Thank you very much once again for the very wonderful speaker for this session, Dr. Willy Renandia. And I am Tri Septiana Korniati as the moderator. would like to also thank you very much for having us for this session. Thank you for inviting in the International Guest Lecture Program. Success for Ahmad Dahlan University. Thank you very much. Once again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Waalaikumsalam. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Dr. Willy and also Mrs. Anna thank you. for the material. So before we close today's event, we invite the Dean of Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Mr. Muhammad Sayuti, to give a closing remarks for today's e events. For Mr. Sayuti, time is yours. Oh, uh... But really, for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. So, I am appointed as dean two months ago, Pak Willy. Yeah, and then you. I really, I am really eager to build a stronger relationship between Nanyang, especially the National Institute of Education. Because UAD has been established in 1960, 60. Mm. so it's quite quite old, 62 years old. And then we have a big networking around the Muhammadiyah universities, but really. Mm. So if we are building, starting more concrete relationship between UAD and National Institute of Education, we will broaden the network also for mm. national wide network because we have like a four universities in Papua, NTT, mm. Maluku, Maluku, Utara, Aceh, with mm. total maybe 172, 72 universities under the Muhammadiyah. So refer mm. to the uh, note from Head of Department, Bu Ani Susanti. Uh, we are looking for maybe MOU or closer relationship in the future. So if you are accepting us or maybe <laughs> Pak Willy can approach the dean or the counselor that we are, have opportunity to, to cooperate in more concrete force, like for example, lecture exchange, student exchange, Join publication, join, join research with the 
National mm. Institute of Education, we will very happy to mm. to discuss and then to to start the cooperation. Thank you very much, Pak Willy. Thank you, Pak. So yes. we love to invite you again someday, Bu Ani, ya, or mm. your colleague from National Institute of Education. Yes. To make our relationship stronger. Yeah. Thank you. Terima kasih. Semoga you, ketemu di Singapura, Pak Willy ya. Atau di Jogja. <laughs> ya, atau di Jogja ya. Itu Bu Ani, yes. terima kasih. Thank you very much, Pak Sayuti and Pak Willy. Thank you, Bu. Mana MC-nya? Sudah. Okay. MC-nya lupa. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you Mr. Sayuti for the warm speech. So, before we close our event again, the uh, Dr. Ani as the head of English education will symbolically hand over a certificate to Mrs. Anna and also Dr. Willy. And please the operator to ta took the documentation. Okay, Pak Willy, thank you very much for uh, uh, enlightening us here all together, and thank you very much for sharing the the, the new knowledge. Maybe not new, but uh, new motivation for us. Uh, I share this. Mm. Um, I share screens. Yes. The certificate for you. Thank you, Matur Nuwanibu. Thank you very much. Misamiwa. Okay. Uh, thank next, you. yeah, thank you, Bu Anna, as the one of the inspiring alumni, and I think this is one of the contributions of the alumni to the uh, institutions and to the juniors, um, still uh, working together uh, as one of the moderator of this international guest lecture series. Mm -hmm. Thank you thank very you much. Also. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, also, to okay. everyone. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our event today. Before closing the event, let's take a picture for the documentation. Okay. Make sure to open your camera and also don't forget to give your best smile also. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Please open yes. the camera, please. Okay. Kita akan screenshot dari slide pertama sampai berapa slide ya, Mas Operator? Lima, five slides. Oke, okay, sampai lima slide. Jadi saya akan hitung ya. Untuk, oke, okay, untuk slide pertama sudah siap? Oke, okay, untuk slide pertama saya hitung. One, two, three, cheese. Oke, okay. slide kedua Baik Oke, okay. please open the camera Saya hitung One, two, three Cheese Oke, okay. slide ketiga Saya hitung One, two, three Cheese Oke, okay, lanjut lagi slide keempat. Saya hitung lagi. One, two, three, cheer. Oke, okay, the last. One, two, three, cheers. Oke, okay, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you for the operator too. Once again, thank you to Dr. Willy, Mrs. Anna, Mrs. Ani, and also Mr. Sayuti for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Aisha Ril Surya, representing all of the committees. I would like to say thank you so much for your participation, mm -hmm. and let's close our event today by reciting Hamdalah together. Alhamdulillah. So, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you on the next time. Bye bye. Waalaikumsalam.
Thank you.